uh, hello. I uh, would just like to give a little background. Um, my uh, my uh, Volga German ancestry comes from my great grandparents who were married in Russia in 1903 and uh, came to this country in 1907. Uh, they first settled in uh, Green Lake County where my uh, great grandfather worked um, on the uh, Lawsonia golf course uh, doing groundskeeping. And uh, then they went for a season out to the Great Plains and uh, worked in the wheat harvest uh, out there. Um, my great grandmother didn't really like that, uh, so they came back to Wisconsin uh, and settled in Oshkosh, where uh, my great grandpa worked in the at the paint lumber lumber company, um, and uh, that is is where. Um, uh, quite a few of their children worked. Um, one, one of his daughters actually came to Sheboygan for a brief time and was a bookkeeper at the Phoenix uh, Chair Company. Uh, so that's my one connection to the whole German um, community here in Sheboygan. Um, so through this presentation, I'm going to give uh, kind of an overview of the history of the Volga Germans and um, how they came to end up in Russia and then eventually how they uh, came to America. The, uh, there was a royal marriage in uh, 1745 and this is really the event that led to our ancestors uh, going to Russia. Uh, Princess Sophia von Anhalt Zerbst married Grand Duke Peter of Russia. Uh, Peter's aunt at the time was the uh, Elizabeth was the Empress of Russia. Uh, Princess Sophia was a uh, German princess and went to Russia. Uh, she uh, quickly learned. Um, Russian and converted to the uh, Russian Orthodox faith and took the name Catherine. In 1762, um, the uh, Empress Elizabeth died and her nephew Peter III was crowned the emperor. Um, and uh, he was not very popular uh, with the uh, aristocracy in Russia. Uh, so he became the Tsar on the 5th of January and the 9th of July. Um, he was overthrown and eight days later was murdered. Um, Catherine and Peter did not have the greatest marriage and uh, she uh, had uh, taken up as a lover, uh, Count Gregory Orloff, who masterminded the, the coup that overthrew Peter. Catherine became uh, the Empress of Russia at age 33, and she was to uh, rule Russia for the next 34 years. Uh, for those who are interested in knowing more about Catherine, I recommend either of these books. Uh, the uh, first one is uh, Catherine the Great by Robert Massey, who has written quite a bit on the uh, Romanov uh, dynasty. Um, and then the book Catherine by Sigrid uh, Wiedenweber uh, is more from a Volga German uh, point of view. It's uh, historical fiction, um, but she really tries to stay uh, true to the, uh, the historical facts, um, and uh, so that, that would be another book. The, uh, the Massey book I know is at the Mead Library here, uh, so that's where I checked it out when I read it. No <laughs> way. Um, very shortly after coming to the, th the throne, Catherine uh, turned her attention to the settlement of the eastern frontier in Russia. Um, 
that this was land that was sparsely populated and she wanted to bring settlers there to uh, essentially uh, tame the frontier. Uh, so in 18, or 1762, uh, the Russian government issued a manifesto that was distributed throughout Europe and it was supposed to attract settlers, but it didn't have uh, much for detail as to the conditions that they would immigrate under, and very few people responded. So in 1763, they uh, revisited it and uh, made a lot of promises to the uh, potential colonists. Uh, they promised freedom of religion for Christians who do not proselytize, uh, exemption from taxation for 30 years, 0% loans for a period of 10 years, exemption from being conscripted into the military, rations and free transport to their destinations, uh, rights were to extend uh, to their descendants, um, and they had the freedom, or were promised the freedom to settle anywhere in the Russian Empire. <laughs> uh, so, the reason that uh, so many people responded to this were uh, the conditions in Central Europe, especially uh, in the western part of uh, Germany. We had uh, just generations of destructive warfare, uh, the Thirty Years' War and the Seven Years' War, with the Seven Years' War just ending uh, at the time the proclamation was, uh, was issued. Um, and uh, the rights that they were promised were really attractive because uh, these people didn't have freedom of religion. Uh, there was the places they lived had state religion, so you were either supposed to be Catholic or some form of Protestant, uh, according to the ruler of your area. Uh, they were subject to compulsory military service, and they had no realistic chance of owning their own land, but worked for the landed nobility in uh, what was uh, basically a feudal system. Uh, This map shows uh, where they came from. Uh, let's see. So lar largely from this part of Germany and some, um, some from Switzerland and the uh, Alsace-Lorraine area um, of France. Um, the red on the map indicates places they settled. Uh, so the uh, the large, or more umbrella term, Germans from Russia applies to all these German settlements. Um, the uh, people who came to Sheboygan and settled were uh, the group known as the Volga Germans who settled in this area. The first settlements were in the Volga. Um, up here by St. Petersburg, which attracted uh, largely professionals and tradespeople. Uh, and then a small settlement in the Ukraine here. These settlements uh, all occurred in the early 1800s uh, and down here in the Caucasus. These people are known as the Black Sea Germans. Um, and uh, that's the. Um, a lot of those people went out to the Great Plains, especially in the Dakotas. Um, some resources on um, finding uh, German origins of uh, different families are uh, uh, a book by uh, Brent Mai and uh, Donna Reeves Marcourt, German Migration to the Russian Volga. Uh, and, uh, then uh, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia has a German origins project on their website uh, and you can find a surname you're interested in 
and they keep that up to date with the latest research as to where in Germany uh, or where else in Europe the family name came from. Uh, and then also there's uh, Volga German Institute and the Center for Volga German Studies also have websites on that subject. The uh, colonists came in a short period of uh, 1763 through 1766. Uh, this graph here shows uh, the number of colonists coming in each of those years. Uh, so it, it's uh, 1766, it, it just boomed. Uh, and actually overwhelmed the uh, Russian government's ability to transport people, and so they had to contract, contract with a lot of private um, shippers to, uh, to bring people to Russia. Um, oops. So the people coming from Europe made their way to the German port of Lübeck, for the, mo for the most part. Um, and there they uh, took passage on ships and were transported through the Baltic uh, up to uh, Oranienbaum, which is a um, small town outside of uh, St. Petersburg, um, where uh, Catherine had a palace. And uh, that was kind of like their Ellis Island. The people were received there. Uh, their um, names were taken along with uh, some information about where they came from, what their occupations were. Um, and from there, it would then be decided where uh, they, would, they would be settled. Two books document this uh, this part of their migration. Uh, Igor Plebe uh, has a book called Lists of Colonists to Russia in 1766, which is uh, translations of passenger lists. Uh, the cover is a little scary because it's all in Russian, but the inside is in English. Uh, and then uh, Georg. Rauschenbach's book, Auswanderung Deutscher Kolonisten nach Russland im Jahre uh, 1700, uh, 66. Uh, that is in Rus Russian and German. Um, it uh, makes some corrections to uh, Mr. Plavey's book and has some additional information um, about the uh, ships that. Uh, that took the colonists to Russia. The uh, migration was organized by uh, what was known as the CONTOUR, uh, which comes from an acronym uh, for the organization, which is called the Office of Guardianship of Foreign Settlers. Uh, Count Gregory Orloff, who masterminded the coup that brought Catherine to power, was in charge of this, which really shows how much of a priority this was to her government, that she put her favorite um, in charge, and that this was initiated so soon after she came to power. Um, the uh, contour had an office in Saratov, which is a large town on the Volga, um, and uh, that was kind of where the, the center of all the settlement activities uh, took place. And that office helped uh, them settle. It arranged for the shipment of lumber to build houses. Um, it, uh, uh, it also controlled uh, if they wanted to move from one place to another. Uh, and uh, what they found is the first the first right they were promised, the freedom to settle anywhere in the Russian Empire, was the first one to go. As soon as they were in Russia, the Russian government knew where they wanted them, and they wanted them as farmers on the Volga, and that's where they put the vast majority of them. Um, 
So you had people who maybe were craftsmen uh, that immigrated and maybe thought they were going to settle in a city and pursue their, their trade. Uh, and they ended up down on the Volga River as farmers. The, uh, uh, this contour made changes to their, uh, their rights. Uh, they uh, had their status changed from colonists to settler landowners, and it was a legal definition that uh, really took away that right to settle wherever they wanted to. Uh, the contour office controlled Volga German life uh, until 1876 when it was uh, disbanded. The uh, process of going from Iranian bound to the Volga took a year. Uh, they generally they boarded river boats and came down this river and then crossed overland to this one, and then took this over to the Volga and down. Um, and then there was a, a more northerly route that went kind of off the map and connected with Volga here. This overland route that it shows here uh, was really used only in the first couple of years that uh, settlers came. Uh, so, if your settlers came to Russia in the 1766 to 67 period, which um, most, you know, the vast majority did, then they took this combination of river and uh, land route. Um, during the winter, they were um, actually, uh, when the Volga froze up, they were quartered with Russian peasants. And the Russian peasants were then reimbursed for any food that they, um, the food and lodging they supplied to the uh, uh, colonists. Uh, this phase of their journey is uh, documented in a couple works. Uh, Brent Mai has a book called Transport of the Volga Germans from Iranian Bound to the Colonies on the Volga. Uh, it's is really just a list of they in the archives they found lists of uh, the colonists that were transported under the charge of different military officers and uh, Brent uh, trace or translated these and they have some notes about people who died along the way um, and then uh, oops. Uh, and then Georg Rauschenbach uh, as Deutsche Kolonisten auf dem Weg von St. Petersburg nach Saratov. Uh, and uh, he provides a lot more context to, uh, to the story of uh, this part of their migration. Again, his book's in German and Russian, so you need to know one or the other to, uh, to get uh, that part of the story out of it. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, um, tale of how they, they managed to uh, transport the people into the heart of Russia. The uh, geography of the region is uh, distinguished by the sides of the Volga that uh, people lived on. On, on on the west side, this was called the Berg Seite, uh, which means the hillside. Uh, so here's the Volga River, and this is the hillside. It's uh, there's bluffs that go down to the river, and when you go inland, it's uh, a lot of uh, it, you know, it's more of an upland that has had rivers and streams cut into the, uh, cut valleys into the uh, landscape. The, uh, the east side is called the Wiesenseite, which is the meadow side. 
and it's flat. So it's, that's this side. Um, there's very, any elevation here is very slight. This side is also uh, much more dry. Uh, some of the rivers on this side would dry up in the uh, summer. The uh, majority of the people who ended up in Sheboygan came from uh, a group of villages along uh, here, which this river is called the Karaman. Uh, Rheinwald, Schaefer uh, being the two um, you know, biggest contributors to uh, Sheboygan's population of Volga Germans. <coughs> this is a map of Wisconsin with uh, what in the 1920s was called the Volga German Autonomous uh, Republic. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so that is this, this yellowish part. Uh, the red outline is what is shown on this, this big map here. Some of the Volga German settlements weren't in the Autonomous Republic. There's uh, up here, there's uh, Jagadina, Pollyanna, <coughs> which uh, uh, had a lot of people go to uh, Oshkosh. Um, and it was kind of an outlier uh, of, uh, of the Volga German villages. The, uh, when they first came, the uh, west side was uh, mostly inhabited by nomadic uh, Kyrgyz tribesmen. And in the first years of the settlement, they actually raided and destroyed some villages and carried people away as captives. And they either were killed or sold into slavery. And a few of the villages that they had done this to just were abandoned and never rebuilt. Uh, another thing that happened in the early history was a uh, man named uh, Pugachev uh, emerged kind of out of nowhere claiming to be Catherine's husband saying he didn't really die. But, uh, and, uh, uh, and he raised a peasant army and tried to uh, take the Russian crown. And uh, during, uh, during the final campaign of, of when he was pursued by the Russian army, uh, he came and he, uh, he burned uh, the contour office in Saratov. Uh, and, and then he swept down this road uh, and uh, uh, basically looted uh, villages uh, as he went down uh, and uh, uh, several months later uh, he was actually captured and uh, executed and that ended his revolt. Uh, the uh, impact on our people uh, was uh, just this memory combined with that of the Kyrgyz of, of these early days being turmoil and hardships that they thought they were getting away from when they came, you know, left Germany and, and Central Europe. Um, and uh, that also, a lot of records were lost when they uh, burned and looted the contour office. When, when I first thought of uh, even trying to find anything about my family in Russia, uh, it, it just seemed like a mysterious black hole, and I had no idea what, what records they even created there. Uh, but it, it turns out they actually uh, created a lot of interesting records that enable, enable you if you can uh, trace back uh, maybe just even one or two generations into Russia that you could end up going all the way back to the uh, original uh, colonist. Uh, they, uh, uh, they created what uh, was called revision lists. These were uh, based on a census that was taken uh, 
during Peter the Great's rule to uh, essentially divide land up and uh, uh, for for the Volga German villages, this was very important. You, the land was held communally in the villages and it got apportioned uh, based on, to each family, based on how many males were in the family. Uh, which, uh, kind of when I learned about this, it made me realize why my great grandma always preferred boys <laughs> to the girls in the family. Uh, you know, economically, they were more important because that's how you, you got your proportion of the farmland uh, assigned to the village. Uh, so there's actually lists of these from 1775. Uh, that's only kind of a partial list. There's the, the 1798 list, which is uh, complete, uh, or mostly complete. Uh, we actually have these books in the back. Uh, and uh, so th this is essentially um, a, uh, you know, a census like we're used to where it lists all the, uh, you know, the head of the household and all the people in the household. It tells their relationships and their ages. Uh, this one else, the 1798 one, in the translation has information on the uh, crops grown in the villages, it has a little report that the Russian official did on conditions in the village. Uh, you know, one of the things, you can learn things like some of them had infestations of gophers that were destroying the crops uh, that happened in, in my ancestral village. <laughs> and, uh, you know, di just different conditions of, uh, of life uh, in the villages. These revisions were done up to 1857, and uh, there's two uh, two big gaps in the records. The, uh, uh, the the third one, which is done in 1767, it's called the first settlers list usually because that that was when all the settlers should have been on the Volga, and so that would list the first families in the villages. There's a 31 year gap between that and the complete 1798 uh, revision, and so you, you could have people who came here and, and they died before this time, and you, you don't and any children they had in between here, you don't really have connected to the parents uh, by any records. Uh, this also occurs between 1798 and 1834. Uh, so you generally hope, like in 1834, if your ancestor is married and has children, that they were a child born before 1798. Uh, otherwise, it, you would be hard pressed to connect them back. Uh, the uh, 1834, the 1850, and 57 censuses are pretty easy to get. Also, uh, Brent Mai and uh, the AHSGR have translated a lot of them. Uh, some of them are um, available, actually some of them are online now uh, through the LDS Family History Library. Those are actually copies of the originals, so you would have to be able to read uh, handwritten Russian. Uh, so <laughs> the translations are much more convenient. Uh, and uh, Brent Mai uh, has a document that uh, lists the ones he's translated and that are for sale and the AHSGR website also lists what the ones that they have. Um, the original colonies were allocated just so so much land 
and they tended to be hemmed in by each other and by Russian villages that were in the area. Uh, each village was a fairly compact settlement and it was surrounded by uh, farmland. Uh, and that's a, that's a big difference. Here, we're kind of used to farmland being like you go out in the country and there's a farmhouse and you go a mile and there's a farmhouse. Uh, and that, that's because of how the uh, public land was distributed in the United States, uh, according to what was called the town range system. Uh, but in Europe, that, uh, that didn't exist. So if some families, if you got farmland allocated that was quite a bit away from the village, you might spend half a day going out to the fields to work it, and then they'd usually just camp out you know, in the fields uh, to uh, to work it rather than losing the valuable time going back and forth. Uh, so part of the thing is, as the population grew, the land allotments shrank. And so essentially the people would, would become land poor. And so they appealed to the Russian government because on the uh, Wiesenseite here, there was a lot of land that was uh, vacant. And so they received permission to create what were called daughter colonies. So, well often, if you're reading about the Volga Germans, you'll read about mother colonies. Those were the original ones, which there was 102 of them. And then daughter colonies, which were formed in usually in the 1850s uh, when uh, people moved more over into the Wiesenseite uh, to form these new villages and acquire new land. Um, also in the mid 1800s there was uh, a Mennonite uh, group that came. They, they settled kind of in this area on the Wiesenseite. Uh, they came from East Prussia uh, they came for to be able to have religious freedom, and uh, so between 1855 and 1875, they they settled on the Wiesenseite. Uh, at uh, one, at a later point, they uh, started to be uh, persecuted in Russia also, and they were one of the first um, German-Russian groups to uh, uh, decide to come to the United States. <laughs> Uh, these two czars really presided over uh, our ancestors' loss of their rights under the original manifesto. Uh, Alexander II, uh, who ruled from 1855 to 81, was known as the Tsar Liberator because he freed the Russian serfs from bondage to their, um, uh, their aristocratic masters. Uh, these people were essentially slaves uh, and he, uh, when he freed them, uh, this created more pressure to, uh, for them to acquire land because they, they could now. Uh, and some of them moved to the Wiesenseite and founded villages. Um, the uh, contour was closed so in the past, while it was a very controlling organization, it also advocated for the settlers. And uh, so when they closed it, they didn't have this governmental body to essentially appeal to. Uh, Alexander also ended the military service exemption in 1871. And in 1874, the first uh, full German men were drafted. Alexander was um, assassinated in 1881, and his uh, son Alexander III uh, became czar. And he uh, had a policy known as Russification. And this policy was aiming at making 
all the people that lived in Russia, Russians. Russia has a vast amount of minority groups that largely retain their own culture, language, uh, and so this affected many people, not just uh, the Germans in Russia. Uh, but some of it was very much directed at Germans. So there was a uh, promotion of anti-German uh, sentiment by what were known as pan-Slavic intellectuals. Uh, these were people who were trying to promote Slavic culture and say this this is our culture, this is what people that live here need to be following. There was an interference with local school curriculum before the German churches were able to run their, the schools and their villages and um, decide their own curriculum. Um, and the Russian government at this time said, well, you've got to start teaching these children Russian and and made other changes to the uh, curriculum. And this was all aimed at assimilating the people into the Russian population. Having been there for over a hundred years now, that they never assimilated and they had really no intention to. Also in this era, uh, because of the land, uh, allotments shrinking and the land was depleted uh, of uh, organic properties based because they didn't really practice crop rotation um, there were major there was crop failure in 1879 to 81 and then droughts in 1885 1889 1892 and 1898 um, so they were really hit hard at the end of the 19th century. Um, this period, uh, as far as genealogy is concerned, is usually documented in what were called uh, personal lists or family lists. And those were essentially a village level uh, census. And it was supposed to originally um, it was originally created in Lutheran villages to track who had taken communion. Um, these are usually, if the, these exist for your villages, that's usually where you will find the people that actually came to the United States. Um, the difference between these and a census is they added information over time. So you have births of children added in over time, uh, deaths and, and other events. And uh, the uh, American Historical Society of Germans from Russia have been acquiring uh, and translating these lists. Uh, you can also get um, extracts from them from the Russian archives also. Um, uh, these are going to be some papers that uh, your, your uh, ancestors might have brought from Russia. Um, this is a military discharge paper, um, and it has the uh, just the details of the military service, uh, where they were drafted from, um, and other notations on their service. Uh, it's interesting too. This uh, this particular document is my great grandpa's, uh, and while his name was Johann Georg, they. Uh, actually called him Johann Davidovich, uh, and uh, Davidovich meaning the son of David. So because they use that Russian uh, patronymic middle name, then we knew that his dad's name was David. In 1874 to 1880, about one third of the Mennonites that had settled in the Volga area uh, emigrated. They largely went to uh, Kansas and the Great Plains. In 1874, this group of men uh, were part of a delegation that the Volga colonists sent to take a look at the United States and identify places they might want to relocate to. Um, 
and they came back with a very positive report. Brazil and Argentina were also locations, uh, and even some of the people that settled in Wisconsin first went to Brazil or Argentina, and maybe went back to Russia and then came here, or just went directly to the United States from South America. Uh, those governments were looking for hard-working settlers, and they subsidized the immigration and settlement. Uh, Argentina was much more to the liking of the Volga Germans, uh, so that settlement really thrived. So there is still a lot of uh, Volga German descendants in Argentina. Uh, the first immigrants went to Brazil in 1877, others went to Argentina, and after 1889, uh, then uh, Argentina was the preferred destination. Uh, this is a document that a lot of families would bring with them. It, this is a parish certificate when they were leaving. Uh, the the uh, minister or priest would uh, write up this document, which lists everybody in the household, uh, their dates of birth and the place of birth, uh, when they were confirmed, when they were married. Uh, this one over here has a note as to why they're leaving the parish. It says they're leaving for America. Um, this, this one is written in Russian. Uh, we have one on display um, from uh, Ann Lautenschlager's family that uh, was written in German. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, it just depends on what the pastor, uh, which language the pastor felt like using, I guess. Another thing that they would have brought would be a passport, and uh, the uh, passport will uh, indicate where where it was issued. We'll have stamps for when they left Russia. A lot of uh, a lot of people left from the port of Libau, uh, so that's a, a common uh, notation to find in in a Volga German passport. Uh, the, this section here uh, indicates the head of the household the passport was issued to, and then his family uh, has his wife and children. The pages in here are written in Russian, in German, and in French. Um, and, uh, so, so the names will actually have their forms in Russian, German, and French. For those who remain, life was very hard. Uh, the, the 1904 to 1905 Russo-Japanese War uh, involved uh, many Volga German men who were drafted into the army or had gone into the reserves and were called back into service. Um, and then uh, World War I was a, a disaster for Russia. Uh, they were very badly defeated and uh, essentially that caused the government to fall, leading to the Russian Revolution, and then uh, Civil War until 1922. Uh, some of the people in the Volga German colonies uh, were uh, executed uh, during the Civil War time uh, for uh, uh, resisting the uh, communists. Uh, in, in the village that my great grandma came from, there exists a list of men who were arrested and executed, uh, and uh, a bunch of people with her family name are on that list. Uh, and that really doesn't surprise me since that family is very opinionated <laughs> and <laughs> spoke their minds. <laughs> um, during the end of the Civil War, uh, a famine broke out in Russia, and the Volga Relief Society was formed by uh, Volga Germans in the United States to assist the, uh, the American Relief Administration was a government uh, agency that uh, would ship supplies uh, and food to Russia 
Uh, and so the Boulder Relief Society worked through that agency to uh, uh, try to help the family, their family members that stayed in Russia. In 1932 and 33, there was another famine that was largely brought on by the uh, communists' uh, collectivization of farms. And uh, the, uh, the uh, communists were largely from an industrial, uh, the industrial workers. They didn't really understand agriculture, and so their government policies were quite disastrous for, uh, for the farmers in Russia. In 1918 and from 1918 to 1941, uh, they had their own uh, state under the uh, Soviet government uh, called the Volga German Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, and uh, this uh, so this is a map of uh, of that area. It contained almost all the Volga uh, colonies. In 1941, with the invasion of Russia by Germany, uh, Joseph Stalin decided that these Germans that were in the path of the invasion needed to be removed, uh, suspecting that they might uh, help the German army. There's really no indication that that even would have been the case, uh, but uh, he had them deported uh, to Siberia uh, and uh, it was essentially one day they just show up at the village and you're given a small amount of time to gather some belongings and put on boxcars and shipped out to uh, Siberia uh, and uh, have to start all over again. Uh, and uh, that's, even now, there are very few Germans in the Volga German area. Uh, there are a lot of them in Siberia, because that's, that's where they remained. And uh, it was only re in recent years that they even had the freedom to move back to the Volga, but they just really didn't have a connection uh, anymore uh, to that region. And this is my final slide on Volga Germans in Sheboygan. So the first Volga Germans came in 1892. By 1930, there were 550 Volga German families here. 230 from Rheinwald and 170 from Schaefer. So those two villages make up the majority of the Volga Germans that came to Sheboygan. Uh, Kohler Company became the largest employer, uh, but others worked at the chair factories, Volrath, the Garden Toy, and uh, what was called the Hand Knit Hosiery Company. In the summer of the first e several years that they were in the United States, they would sometimes uh, go down to Racine County or out to Michigan and work in the sugar beet fields. And uh, the, the whole family would work in the fields. Uh, the uh, little shaded areas are Volga German households. And uh, this is a pattern that shows up um, in uh, other Wisconsin cities where they really cluster in a small area. So this is Erie between 8th uh, and the Bend of the River, which uh, became known as Russian Boulevard informally. Uh, and uh, to me, this, this was a way of their recreating their village life. Uh, when they were on the Great Plains with the farmsteads spread out, uh, they didn't have that village life, or it was very hard to create. But in the cities, they could settle in a small part of the city and uh, essentially preserve that uh, village life 
and you know go to the same church um, and uh, have other other uh, social activities um, and uh, hang on to the uh, to their culture once once their children started intermarrying with a population outside the Volga German community, then you kind of see that disappearing. My grandpa was born in the United States. He didn't want to be German. He didn't. He wanted to be American. We would get scolded if we said "ja." <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, he was one of that. And then he married uh, a lady who was from English an and Dutch ancestry, and her ancestors had been in this country since the 1600s. Uh, and, and you see that, you see the recent immigrants marrying into families that had been in the United States for a longer period of time, and then just assimilating. And so the importance to me of gathering like this to learn about this history is to kind of reclaim some of what's been lost uh, to be able to talk to the people who still remember uh, their older relatives who passed down stories um, of the, uh, you know, of the old country and their experience coming to the United States, and um, yeah, to me, um, it's it's a heritage that is full of drama and adventure, um, and. Uh, you know, they, they led very hard lives, but they were also hardworking and faithful people that uh, really uh, did what Catherine wanted them to do. They created a viable agricultural area on the Volga where the wilderness had been before they were uh, settled there.